Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hey. Welcome to our fourth um, Art Tech Nashville meetup. Um, today, we're talking with, oh, I'm Katie. <laughs> and today, we're talking with Zach Keller, who is the lead tech designer at Lonely Planet. And he's going to talk to us a bit about his process and what it really means to do like UX UI design. I know um, before I got into the tech team for me, it was just kind of like, you know, you know, like where buttons were and how you push them. <laughs> um, and I've since learned how much more complicated and how many how many other things kind of come into play and factor into it. Um, when, when it comes to UI and UX to me, when I need to design something, it's always design a green button. People like to click green <laughs> button. That's what I know about, about UX. UI. <laughs> Is that accurate, Zach? <laughs> Is it just uh, always make a green button? Every every button I've ever designed has been green. <laughs> <laughs> different different shades of green. <laughs> Very cool. Well, um, welcome everyone. We're glad that you're here with us. If you um, are watching on Facebook um, or YouTube, feel free to comment in the chat there, um, and we'll be able to pass that question along to Zach if you're um, in LinkedIn, our LinkedIn group. Um, we'd love to see your questions there as well. Yeah, and without further ado, um, <coughs> let's hear what Zach has to say. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. the The intro to the the video thing was amazing. Like, like that was, Isn't that cool? <laughs> it was yeah. super super professional. I was really impressed. Um, so I'm Zach. Uh, I am currently the lead UX designer at Lonely Planet. If if you don't know Lonely Planet, we are a travel guidebook publisher that's been around since the early '70s. Um, we started in Australia as kind of this hippie backpackers guide. And uh, we are currently navigating the world of trying to figure out how to go from a predominantly print-based business to having more of a digital um, presence, where we do have a digital presence, but we're really trying to double down on that right now. Um, so I've been here for about four years. When I started at Lonely Planet, I was on the, um, for lack of a better term, sales team. So we would have outside partners come to us like, you know, a tourism board, say London Tourism, um, you know, Ford Motor Company or uh, GoPro or somebody, they come to us and, and they would have an X amount of money that they wanted to spend and they wanted us to help them promote a specific location or product. And we would come up with custom solutions that we would build as one-off, you know, products for the Lonely Planet website that we would help advertise with the partners. Uh, and then about two years ago, I moved over to the core team, uh, core digital team. So I started working on the, the website as a whole and not just the partnership properties of it. And uh, Katie worked with me for a while. So I got to know Katie while she was at Lonely Planet. She has moved on. I'm sure her new job is great, but we really miss having her around. So, oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. I definitely miss the team there. Yeah, it's a good group of people for sure. It sure is. It sure is. Yeah. <clears throat> Tell us something, Zach. Uh, so you you went from being a, an art student, an art student, to you went to NSS, and from mm -hmm. there you started your journey, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I went to um, college for graphic design. I, I went to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and after college, I, I worked a you know a bunch of design jobs, doing logos and. Uh, branding packages for different clients and internal teams. I uh, did a lot of book cover work in the publishing industry, which is funny that I'm still in publishing, even though I don't read a lot of books. Um, but I, uh, I I did that work for a long time, and it was probably, oh gosh, I can't even remember what year I went to NSS. I was in cohort number two for that, if that means anything to anyone who's listening. Who, oh, wow. I, I, was, I was core 36. <laughs> okay, so I was 34 cohorts before guy, um, <laughs> but uh, basically, I was I was really into technology um, and the intersection of design and technology, and I was big at the time. I was really big into like modifying and customizing Android phones, so like early Android phones, and I was constantly hacking on Android phones, and I got really into like the UI of it and customizing the UI. And I started thinking, like, as I'm sitting there doing, like, 
per, point purchase displays for books that this company's putting out. I'm like, man, I really don't want to be doing this anymore. I want to be doing like UI work and like helping to create software. So I asked my um, the VP of our creative department at the time or that internal team, like, hey, you know, could you guys maybe, you know, help me get some like outside learning to do some more of the web stuff around here? And uh, this, this guy was like, well, I think that would be great if you learned web stuff, but we can't pay for it. Um, we really want to hire a dedicated web designer because if I do, our, our uh, department budget gets up and I can buy some new cameras I want. So I'm like, okay, so you don't want to invest in me. You want to hire somebody else so that you can buy more cameras. So at that point, I was like, I think I need to get out of here. Um, I think I need to figure out how to, how to learn this kind of stuff on my own. And I started looking around and trying to figure out um, where I could go to learn how to ap apply what I know about design into software development. Um, and I really, I didn't really know where to go. So I knew that Belmont College here in Nashville had a uh, computer programming course. So I, I went as like a, you know, an old guy student and I applied to Belmont and I, they, they accepted me. I was amazed because I didn't do all that great in college, to be honest. <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. So Belmont will, you know, let me come to school here and I'll take some computer programming classes. Um, and I got, a, I got a loan and everything and I showed up for orientation and I started talking to the head of the computer programming department there. And I told him, you know, what I wanted to do in my story. And he's like, we're not going to teach you that here. He's like, you're going to, we're, we're going to teach you like basics of functional programming and like COBOL and all these like old school languages. And I'm like, so you guys aren't going to teach anything about like the, you know, designing software and stuff and, and like how to, how to actually write HTML, CSS, JavaScript. And he's like, no, we're not. He's like, but you need to call this guy, John Gork, because he's got this thing called Nashville Software School. He's starting up and this is exactly what you need to be doing. And, and I was like, uh, okay. So he like showed me the website and I was like, this looks great. So I, I ran out of there and I was like, I gotta, I gotta withdraw from the school before the loan hits. <laughs> money. And so I ran across the street to a coffee shop and I, uh, I called John Bork and he, he's like, yeah, who is this? And I'm like, Hey, I'm this guy, you know, I'm, I just quit my job. I'm trying to learn how to design software. And, you know, he's must've thought I was a crazy person. Um, but he was like, you know, well, we're all full up for the next cohort and it starts in two days. I don't know what to tell you. And I'm like, where are you right now? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, well, I'm at, you know, whatever other coffee shop. So I literally drove over there and, and came in. I was like, hey, look, man, I know you don't know me, but like, I really want to make this happen. Um, I'll be a good student. Like, I'll be dedicated here. Just surely there's one more spot for me. And so he let me in. Um, and, and so I like talked my way into cohort two. And uh, it was the hardest professional decision I've ever made, but it was the best professional decision I ever made because I learned how to write code. Um, I learned what the, you know, sophomore software development process was like at a, you know, at a base level, you're not going to learn everything in NSS. And it allowed me to get some gateway jobs uh, to, to doing, you know, design for the web and design for software and some front end development roles. And uh, I haven't looked back since it's been great. I, I have done a little bit of print design since then, usually on the side for friends, but like, I do not miss going to stinky print shops and having to press check, you know, <laughs> posters and floor displays and stuff like that. I mean, it was great. I'm glad I had that knowledge, but I'm so happy to be working on the digital side now. So that's kind of how I, how I got into this. And it's, it was a tough, scary decision, but it was really great. I, I completely hear you. I, I've been to NSS too, and I enjoyed every second being there. It's an amazing place. And I recommend everyone that here us now, if you have, <laughs> if you have any any, um, if you're on the fence of where to go, I can definitely recommend NSS to everyone. Yeah, it's really great. I, I'll tell you, like the, you know, because when I went through it, we did, you know, the front end um, portion, which was the first three months, and it was basic HTML, CSS, JavaScript. I mean, we we didn't really get it. We didn't get into any like really hardcore JavaScript libraries. Like I don't know what what was hot back then. Uh, what are some of the hot old school? The, what is the one that, um, oh gosh, I can't remember. Uh, it starts with an A. Anyway, we didn't do any of that. We did like jQuery and like really basic stuff. So if I had one knock on it is the instructor that I had at the time, um, you know, I had a lot to learn about JavaScript when I left there. Um, but it was, you know, I knew the, the basics, so that was good. But once we got into the back end portion, the Ruby on Rails portion, 
Oh man, like I, I almost quit once or twice. I was just so stressed. Like I couldn't, I couldn't make sense of it. You know, they were teaching us test driven development where it's like so weird to me. It's like you write the test before you write the code. And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't understand that. <laughs> um, but I got through it and, and it was great. And luckily I haven't had to do much back end stuff at all since I've left. Um, usually I have super smart people to handle that for me. So like, you know, I can't get this this build to build or whatever to spin up this you know thing and like fix it for me. And then the back end guy comes in and goes beep, 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 and then it works. <laughs> and cool. And then, but then when they're like, I can't figure out how to make this button, you know, aligned or whatever, then I'll come in there and help them. So it's a uh, it's it's a mutual understanding. Yeah, definitely. Oh, uh, Angular is the JavaScript hotness when I went through. NSS and like we didn't learn any of that. And the first job I had, they're like, you know, Angular, right? And I'm like, I have heard of Angular. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Oh, (laughs) we have a great comment. um, (laughs) (laughs) Grateful Dead. So Grateful (laughs) Dead fan, which is a not so um, not so secret secret anymore. I mean, it's never been a secret. Between. I mean, anybody it's it's Jeff McLean. Like, no one should know about it. It's That's Jeff, right. Jeff McLean. Anybody who knows me will know that I will talk at length about the 1990 Grateful Dead in particular. So. I was I was wondering if that should make it to the uh, the questions that we have lined up here. Um, we have. Let's see. We have another comment with Challenge at Dev Mountain for iOS development. Mario said, "Come back with your shield." Or on, <laughs> um, yep, hardcore deadhead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we had a, a couple of other questions that um, I think are um, may, might take us on a little bit of a different path. But one question is, and you have a, a choice, um, a choice here with this one. So, um, what's either um, a design that you think? personally is terrible or like a strategy or, you know, a concept, something that's really like popular that you think is terrible, but it just really, really works well. Um, or on the flip side of that, something that really shouldn't work, but for some reason it does. <laughs> Can you think of yeah. any, any examples? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, you know <laughs> what I hate? I hate when you, when it, I don't know if, if anybody here knows what Dribble is. Dribble is a, like a designer showcase website. Okay. Um, and you go to Dribble, and you're like, huh, okay, I need some inspiration. And you type in, like, you know, app interfaces. And a hundred, like, thumbnails come up of, like, designers' hard work. And they all look exactly the same. It's, like, crazy, huge rounded corners. The buttons are, like, super soft um, drop shadows or, like, they're even, like, inverse into the screen so it looks like an emboss or something. And like, man, I hate that look. I hate it. But you know what? Like there's so many apps that I will install that use that look and they get great traction. So clearly I'm just like an old curmudgeon. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't understand what the kids are doing these days. But like all the round stuff is just like, it's okay, like to an extent. But when your whole sort of UI identity is based around, let's have the most obnoxious rounded corners possible I don't, I don't understand how that works, but it, but it does apparently. Um, I still haven't gone like fully rounded. Like I still try to, you know, make sense of it. So like, you know, to me, I don't think every button should have exactly the same shape. You should like certain buttons have different intents, right? One button type could continue along on a, on a process or a flow. And the other one is like the end to the process, like a submit button, you're done mm-hmm. with the flow. So you submit. And it's my opinion that like those buttons maybe should be treated differently to, to clue the user in that like, hey, click here and let's continue along this path where I'm trying to get you to do a thing. Or it's like, you're done with this path, hit the button and we're finished. Um, but I notice on a lot of these these dribble things, like every button is exactly the same. And um, that kind of bothers me, but uh, clearly if, if these are like, some of these are actual real products and they're not just like design exercises or you know, design portfolio pieces, then then they're they're working for some users. Um, I've always I've always been interested in the idea of like taking a Lonely Planet flow and like redesigning it with the dribble look and then user testing it and seeing what the users think. Um, because if 
the users find it more usable, then I'm going to cry. Like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. So, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's one thing that, that I think is not a great design decision, but it's working somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was a hard question, Katie. Thank you. For that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't pull any punches here. <laughs> um, oh, I just had a follow-up question to that. And I completely lost it. You can go for the next question. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so here's another, hopefully a fun one that's not as hard. Um, if you could design something like an app or a website um, for any person, place, or event, what would it be? Huh, that's a tough one too. Gosh. <laughs> um, I it doesn't do have to be like the one. It could just be like something that you think would be fun to do. A passion project of mine is um, one of my buddies is a guy named Brandon Valentine and John knows him. He's on the board at NSS. We're really close friends. And Brandon and I are big into um, sort of adventure based vehicle travel. So we, we go drive off road trucks and on trails and go out you know, as far out off the grid as we can and camp for a couple of days and come back. And, you know, if we get stuck or we break part of the truck, like that's kind of part of the experience, not ideal, but it happens. Um, and we've talked for a while about doing a, an app that would uh, facilitate off-road travel. So imagine a situation where you, you go to the dealership and you buy a Jeep and you're like, I really want to have something I can take my kids camping in. You buy a Jeep and then you're like, I don't know where to go off-road. Right. Like, I don't know where to take it. So if you had some sort of mapping app that would allow you to pull user data um, from other users, potentially users could put together like a, I drove to Montana and I didn't hit paved roads the entire time and I tracked my entire route with GPS. And then they would be able to publish that on this platform and then potentially, you know, sell that route. So that would be the monetary pull there. But it would give an opportunity for people to have a truck or have a you know motorcycle, or whatever, and they want to figure out where they can take it off road on land that's legal to drive on, um, and have it sort of be like an off road navigation and route planning tool that people can put together their own routes and, and sell. Somebody on this call is going to build this app, and I'm not going to make a dollar from it. <laughs> there's, there's actually a there's a similar app that's based out of. Bozeman, Montana, which I've been keeping an eye on lately, and they're called Onyx Off Road, and they do something similar. I don't, I haven't, I haven't purchased the app yet because to get useful features, it's like thirty bucks, and I'm, I'm feeling kind of cheap right now. But I feel like I need to, I need to just pony up and purchase the app. And uh, we're we're doing a family kind of off road adventure trip to Montana this summer, so I might, I might buy the app and try to use it and, and see what they're doing, but. That, that would be an ideal like passion project for me would be to, to build an app like that. That would be cross platform and would facilitate there's been cracks <laughs> numbers. It would facilitate, you know, people to be able to uh, to find their way off road legally. It'd be awesome. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. And look, now you have documentation. We heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> We're a witness. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions? And I, I do not. <laughs> um, so I think we want to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit like kind of more toward the practice side. Um, and I know you have some stuff that you're going to show us here in a few minutes. Um, mm -hmm. So to sort of transition into that, um, has in your experience, has UX UI changed significantly or is it changing significantly now that like we're doing so much stuff on our phones? Like, ha you know, having that, that mobile experience first often? I think so. Um, I've noticed, uh, like, I, I'm, like I said before, I'm, I'm an Android user. So I, I can turn on an iOS phone and I can, like, test with it, but I don't normally use them. Uh, but I know that they've gone to more of a gesture-based operating system, and I know that, that Android has definitely done that as well. So instead of pulling down a menu and clicking a button to get to a thing, it's like you swipe from a certain way off the screen in order to have that interaction happen. So it's not like having specific um, structured and boxed cues for the user to, to fire a UI um, result. It's, it's more of teaching the user how to do it gesturally. 
And I, I think that the web is going to change that way as well. Um, mm -hmm. But the one, the one issue with that is accessibility. And that's something that any good UX designer has to take very seriously because, you know, while, while, you know, I have full use of my hands, thankfully, if I didn't, I wouldn't have a job, but um, you know, I can, I can gesture up, I can move my thumb around in a crazy way to make the thing happen. No problem. But you know, what would happen if I was riding my bike with my kid and I broke my hand, you know, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do that. So, um, you know, while there, there are these sort of going the gestural way, you also have to, to find a fine line of like, um, permanent mobility impairment and um, temporary mobility impairment. And that could be, like I said, somebody's got a broken hand or, you know, whatever. Um, or you have people who, you know, maybe have a physical condition where they can't use their hands properly. Um, so, you know, how do we, how do we kind of do a gestural based thing for people like that? Um, and then also, you know, there's, there's sight impairment, there's color blindness, there's all these things. So, um, but I do think that UI is changing. I think, I think it's, it's changing for the good and the bad. I, I think, you know, the gestural stuff and the big fat buttons are, are, are great for like quick ease of use and everything like that. Um, you know, but there are concerns we have to tackle with that. Like, like I said, with the accessibility issues, um, and, and other concerns. So yes, I feel UI is a constantly changing thing. And I feel like, like design, it kind of goes in and out of fads. Um, so, you know, for, for a while there was like this web 2.0 thing. This is probably before some of the people on this call were born, but, um, you know, it was like all oh, skeuomorphism and everything had to look like it was 3d. You remember the, the initial iPhones where they had like the books sitting on the shelf and that was mm, the, yeah. <laughs> and then it went to like, like everything is flat. Like, the first version of material design that Google put out was it, it had depth, but it was very flat, very hard edged. Um, every, every, like the fonts all looked very like analog and like monotonous kind of, and it worked really well for that time for the way users were interacting with phones. And I feel like users were just starting to get used to that sort of medium. Um, but now if you look at Android or iOS, it looks completely different. Um, so I, I think everything moves in cycles. Um, but it's it's my hope that if we're going to go this gesture based way, that we still have some sort of fallback to help people who maybe can't you know behave that way on their device. Yeah, that's really interesting because it, it's like probably the way that you can or can't interact with with an app or with a device really shapes the you know your kind of attitude toward it maybe. Yeah. So if there's a website that is really difficult to use, you know, it, it sort of feels like you're excluded from that, I think. Yeah. Um, I have that problem with um, certain social media apps that I don't know anything about that my daughter just like flies through there, like mm -hmm. trying to use Snapchat, my nine year old had to give me some, <laughs> some like, oh, this is how you do it. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> well, this, this clearly wasn't made for me. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to think to myself, where where is it going to go? You know, now when a AR is going to be the thing soon, a, are there any guidelines or anything for, oh, yeah. for designing UI and UX for augmented reality application? Is that something that people are already starting to think about? You know, I'm sure they are. Um, I have not had to deal with that at all. Um, so maybe that's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> um, you know, with, with me, the stuff that I'm working on is all, you know, right now it's consumer-based web applications. So there's there's really no need for me to consider an augmented reality, considering that the product that I'm working on is only accessible via a web browser. Um, now, all that to say, if you could go to onlyplanet.com with your crazy goggles on, and you know, all of a sudden, be in Croatia and be clicking through hotels. That sounds pretty awesome. Um, but no, I have no experience with that. I know that it's a thing. I mean, there's there's obviously stuff going around. And I hear that term all the time. Um, but no, I, I have no experience with the virtual reality stuff or augmented reality at all. Really, I mean, I think I've used my phone before, my Android phone, like in a city where you have Google Maps open and you like hold it up and it goes to the Google lens view and like, yeah. you know, it pops up the look, you know, the names of locations as you move your phone around, but I've never really designed for that. No, actually take that back. There was one um, product that we pitched at Lonely Planet when I was on the sales side, that was a augmented reality, something or other that we pitched. And um, 
candidly, I was scared that it would sell because I was like, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to build this. Um, but yeah. So no, yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's like experience. a whole new frontier, right? I mean, how, like training someone, teaching someone how to interact and like a device that just has one, um, you know, one screen that you're interacting with. You know, I, I can only imagine that trying to train in the same way in a 3D space would be so yeah. much more complicated. Yeah, it's cool though. You guys remember Minority Report, that crazy like, you know, interface he had on that movie? Oh, I never saw that. You should, you should Google it. It's in, it Minority Report? Uh huh. Yeah, it oh, was yeah. like a Tom Cruise movie back it, in the yeah. day. Uh -huh. And he, but he had like this crazy touch screen where he could like hit a window and it would like fly out. Oh, and it would and he, like all of them completely in the air. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, was, so, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I remember watching that back in the day going like, I'm going to be designing websites like this one day. <laughs> I'm waiting later. for those. <laughs> Although I can remember being young and making, um, my best friend and I like to make computers out of like cardboard boxes. And I remember at one point they would get smaller and smaller. And we had one that was just like this big and it was flat. And you just push buttons, and we were like, "This is the future." <laughs> Did now. you make computers from cardboard? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Did, is that is that is not that, normal? Did you make Did you make computers from cardboard? <laughs> no, <laughs> I never. I never they heard of it. They have three D buttons and screens. You could replace the the picture on the screen. I have slingshots. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we actually have a question for you in the chat. I'm going to pop it up here. Mm -hmm. um, hi, Zach, Katie, and Guy. I'm a novice trying to la launch a business and design a website. Are there any tips for retaining attention on a site or ways to make a site unique? Good question. Yeah. So, okay. I would say that if you're trying to sell either a product or a service, um, you need to leave the site off with what you're offering and why you're a good fit. Um, so if you're selling towels or something, you know, you obviously need to have pictures of your towels and explain why your towels are the best ones. Um, and as far as making it unique, I think the best thing you can do is make it usable. Um, I think aside from having big flashy colors and buttons, if you can just make the process of a person buying your thing easy to do and painless, then you're going to have success. Um, if, if you're purchasing process and your user flow for that is convoluted and, and hard to deal with. And the buttons are hard to hit when you're, you know, on mobile, um, you know, obviously your conversion rate, which is, you know, the, the rate that people are going to purchase your, your product is going to go down. So I would say that the best UIs are UIs that get out of a user's way and allow them to complete the action that they're there to do. So again, I'm sure you're not selling towels, but if, if you have a, a site that's selling towels, you, you want a user to be able to come to your site, see a towel, say, this is the towel that I have to have, and then be able to, within just a couple clicks, two, three max, they've purchased the towel. Um, user retention is really short these days. People are constantly bouncing all around. Um, you can't expect a user to come to your site and, and spend 10 minutes discovering why you have the best towels. Um, you're lucky, honestly, if you get 10 seconds before a user bounces out. So I would make your, your call to action and your value prop statement loud and clear, easy to read, uh, and I would make sure that your product is visible. Um, now, if you're selling a service, maybe that's different. Like if you're a, you know, a freelance designer or something, that's maybe a little different, but I'm, I'm going to approach this as if you're selling towels. So people need to see the towel. They need to see how awesome it looks. They need to have a value proposition, easy to read, that says, this is why you need my towel. And then you need to have a link to enter them into that purchase funnel as soon as possible. Um, you can't expect a user to scroll very far. Uh, we find that on, I think the last time we tested this on Lonely Planet, on some of our highest traffic pages, the scroll depth for a user was only about 40%. So that means that they're only getting 40% down the page before they're either clicking a link to go somewhere else or leaving the site altogether. So make sure that you have a way for a user to complete the action you want them to complete up high on the page. Don't make them search for it. It would be my recommendation that when you get to the page, you have image of the towel, value prop, and a buy button all right there before a user even has to scroll. Uh, and then once they get into that, that purchase funnel, 
just make it as easy as possible for them. Now you can achieve this with out of the box stuff, you know, Squarespace or a Shopify or, you know, whatever. Um, if you're, you know, writing the code yourself, then even, even better, you can, you can really optimize it then. But um, yeah, definitely don't make your users hunt much, uh, hunt for information, give them all the options you need for them to complete the thing that you want them to complete. And I guess the, the cliff notes here is, Know what you want your user to do and then focus your website to make it as easy as possible for the user to do that. Cool. Um, so I think, let's see, if you're good with it, Zach, maybe let's transition to see what you've got for us and you're gonna talk about some tools that you like um, and yeah. kind of show us some, um, some quick tips and examples. We'll go ahead and switch over to that and then We'll have some room um, time at the end for additional questions. So yeah, feel free to keep posting um, in the chat if you've got stuff you wanna say or questions you wanna ask. Um, feel free to keep posting and we'll get to all of them um, for the end. All right. All right. I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, here we go. So, um, can, every, can Katie and Guy, can you, you guys can see Figma, we're good, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is the the software that I use on a daily basis for for my visual design and prototyping of my apps. Um, it's called Figma. It's a cloud browser based. Well, I won't say browser based. It's a cloud based design software. So the benefit to this is I don't have to save a file on my desktop of all these projects every time. Like I don't even have to hit save. Every time I make a change, it's synced automatically in the cloud and I can log into my Figma account from anywhere and pick up right where I left off. Um, it allows you to do all kinds of things. Um, everything from designing out you know, website templates to creating reusable components, which we would use in what we call a design system. And then also doing full fledged um, clickable interactive prototypes, which we will then take from this and send the link out to go into user testing. Um, so what I've done here is I've just put together a really basic little group of UI components. And I just want to run through what it looks like to build a screen, uh, two screens actually, and then have them linked together as a prototype. So this is a fake book. I just made it up. It's just a, a fake app. Um, and I think what we're going to do here is we're going to try to design like a, uh, coming events page, and then you'd be able to click in and get more details about the event. So these are the two screens that we're going to try to recreate. This one here will be a card carousel view, which each card will have a event. User can swipe through these and then click to go to this frame here, which will be our detail about, um, about that event. Now I haven't thought about this too much, so I'm kind of spitballing here. So bear with me. This probably won't be the, the cleanest um, prototype example I've ever made, but it should give you guys a little overview of how you can use the software should you choose to, to mess with it. So what I've done here is I've, I've got, you know, logos, some buttons, a uh, hamburger menu, a, uh, Search thing, I've gone ahead and just for the sake of time, thrown these together in a header component, which, which we'll reuse. Um, so we'll go ahead and copy this component and then we will paste it into here. We know that this component is going to repeat across all screens on the app. So we'll go ahead and put it over here as well. Next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our card and we're gonna throw that in here. And we know that we're going to need several cards. So we are going to move that out of the way real quick. And we're just going to put some cards together. I'm going to select them all and I'm going to space them out the way that I would expect them to be spaced out. And then I'm going to make sure that they are within our frame or artboard, depending on what you want to call it. And so they're, they're there. Now what we want to do is we want to select all these and we want to wrap these in a frame. And then we'll call that frame carousel. Now we go up here to the prototyping tab. Oh, hi. Um, and then we'll do horizontal scrolling because we know that we want the user to be able to swipe through these cards. So from this point, 
we can test the, the prototype. It's, it's that easy. I'm going to set this as a Google Pixel 2 because that's a, a nice phone size, I feel like, for, for prototyping. Um, so if we click here, we now have uh, – we don't have a working prototype. Bear with me for one second. Oh, goodness gracious. Now it's going to work. Is it? Is it not? Ah, there we go. There we go. So we've got a scrolling prototype now, right? Or sc scrolling carousel. So next what we're going to do is we are going to go over to our next screen and we're going to add sort of a featured image here. We'll take some text and, and we'll put it in here and we'll say, you know, upcoming events or something like that. I want to make that a little more legible, so we'll add a little, little overlay on this here image. There we go. That feels pretty good. And then from here, what we're going to do is we'll just put some description text. Um, I don't know. Let's say party at the basement east or whatever. And then we'll add a action button and we'll say, you know, I don't know, RSVP. And then what we want to do is we want to link these together. So probably the best thing to do would be for us to replicate the title here. So let's say, Right, yeah, the basement east. I knew that that was going to happen, by the way. I knew it was going to push my, my thing down. Um, let's see if I can fix that really quick. Okay, that'll work. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to make it so that when the user clicks on this card, it takes us to the screen. So we'll go over here to the prototyping, and we'll click on Interactions. And here we want to say On Tap, Navigate To, and then we'll select Mobile Screen 2. And we can add a nice little animation in there. So we'll just we'll just do a little dissolve. So it'll kind of fade into that screen. So now if we go back to our prototype and we click on this, it takes us to that, right? So that's fantastic. I haven't added a way to get back, um, but we'll figure that out later. Um, but this is a super powerful prototyping tool. Um, I have some examples I could show of some really like intense prototyping stuff that I've done for Lonely Planet, um, but I don't know how valuable it is to everybody. So if somebody in the chat wants to see an example of that, maybe they could leave a comment. If not, we can uh, we can just go back and, and start talking about you know why I like Figma and the benefits of it or something. Yeah, this is really cool. I I'm wondering. So I've used Figma almost none, um, mm -hmm. and I did really like it, what I was using it for, but I'm wondering how long have you been using it and, you know, that it's become like, you know, second nature almost, it seems like. So we, I use Sketch before um, I use Figma. So it's a similar tool, but there are some, some differences with the way that they handle reasonable components and they don't have a built-in prototyping tool within Sketch. So what we, what we used to do is we would, draw our layouts, design our layouts in Sketch, and then export them as PNGs or JPEGs, and then throw them into another software called InVision, which you could then like basically draw hotspots on the page, which would fire click events to take you to different JPEGs. 
And in my opinion, Envision was really cool when it came out, but it, it's just super limited. Um, it doesn't allow you to do overlays very easily, and there's just a lot of limitations with it. So um, I was using Sketch and Vision at Lonely Planet on the core product team, on the digital product team. And, uh, and I started just reading a lot, seeing a lot of articles about you know, UX and product designers talking about why I'm switching to Figma uh, from Sketch and you should too, you know, articles like this. So I started, I started reading them and I started looking into it. And then I decided um, we had a little bit of a lull in our projects. So I had about a week of kind of off time in between development sprints. And I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a Figma account and I'm just going to start using it. So I took one of the projects that I've been working on at Lonely Planet, which was a, a reworking of our destination pages, which is a super complicated um, prototype. And I rebuilt it in Figma. And after about two days of kind of tripping over my own feet on Figma, I really started to understand um, the differences between it and Sketch. And, uh, and I, I haven't looked back. I've had to use Sketch a couple of times, just like cleaning up some legacy files um, or like helping another designer out who works for a company is a friend of mine who had some sketch files. And, um, but every time I open it, I'm like, man, just, I just, I really like Figma a lot better. Um, so I guess it's been about two years since I've been using this mm -hmm. and they've, they've come out with a lot of updates and stuff since then and added a lot of features. Um, but it's great. It's, it's cheap and it's easy to use and it's super powerful. Um, and there's a really, like hardcore community of the of designers that use Figma, and there's uh, Friends of Figma is a Slack channel that you can get on, and all these great designers from all over the world are talking about Figma and hacks and tips and tricks and job postings, and um, so it's a really cool community. But um, yeah, it's cool. a it's a fantastic tool. It's really nice. But are there any a Figma plugins that you think they're must have? Yeah, so the ones that I use um, every day, I use uh, one called Content Reel. Let's see if it'll load. I was trying to load this earlier today and it didn't work. Okay, so for instance, this this avatar image that I have right here of this, uh, what are you doing? Of this, why are you doing that? Of this lady right here. So this is comes. I, I got this from the uh, the. Um, content reel so like you know here you could just say uh let's i'll just search for avatar maybe here we go so you just click on your your item that you want and then um this is being really like buggy but anyway you can pick avatars from this another one that i use is unsplash so i work in the travel industry and i'm mocking up stuff all day we have a repository of images that I can uh, hit our um, digital asset manager and pull images from. But I know that like all of the content that we put on the site is going to be generated dynamically anyway. So it, it doesn't really make sense for me to go grab like mock-up images from our docu uh, digital asset manager and spend a bunch of time searching for images. So what I use is the Unsplash plugin. Now, none of these images we could actually use in production. But for something like this, like let's say I'm working on a destination page and I want it to be, I don't know, let's just do Croatia because it's beautiful. Um, we've got a Croatia and like here's a great image. I click right there and boom, I have an image of Croatia. Uh, you know, I might pass this off to, to someone and they say, ah, don't do Croatia, let's let's show you know, Rome. Okay, cool. I can come right back here, search for Rome, you know, and then bam, here's an image of Rome as soon as it loads. Um, so the Unsplash one is fantastic. You can search all kinds of stuff in there. You can get textures or you know, different photos, whatever. Let's see if this one works. That would work better. Uh, another one that I use a lot is a plugin called Lorem Ipsum, which seems pretty yeah. self-explanatory. <laughs> so, um, you know, I have a text box. I need roughly about 40 words. Um, and then I can just generate Lorem Ipsum with that. So that's really nice. Um, let's see. A, another one I use from time to time is Iconify. Now, this this just allows you to search for icons. Um, one of the great things about um, working at Lily Planet is I have a guy on my team, um, this fellow named Jacob, who is an absolutely ridiculously talented icon designer. So if I'm working on a thing, I know Jacob is is busy and he doesn't, you know, he's not going to just bang me on an icon in five minutes. Um, I'll search here and just find a placeholder icon to quickly throw into whatever um, layout I'm working on so that I can just keep going. 
And then I can tag Jacob later and say, hey, you know, we need an icon for LGBTQ travelers or um, accessibility travel or whatever. We don't have that existing in our design system. You know, here's the placeholder I have. Can, can you actually come up with one for me? So this, this one here, Iconify, saves me a lot of time. Um, but there are tons of them. There's this one plugin called Figmotion, which a designer who previously worked with me at Lonely Planet, who's now moved on, um, she used to use it a lot. And I haven't really had the time to get through it, but it's it allows you to do complex animations um, within Figma that aren't available out of the box. So that one's really neat. You can do things like, you know, a swipe up gesture on a prototype where a drawer pulls out, and, you know, animates it and all cool. Um, so there's all, there's all kinds of stuff. There are just tons and tons of plugins for it. And there's a really active community um, building out plugins for it. So there's no signs of slowing down. How, how difficult is it once you have a design laid out in Figma to transition it to like an app or, or a website? Does so, Figma help you out with any of that or is it kind of a manual? It, it does. So if you go to the inspect tool here, you can, you can get, you know, widths, heights, colors, um, you can get a rough version of the CSS. Um, so, you know, if you're, if I'm clicking on one of these cards, I can, you know, a developer could grab all of this out, but you know, the, the, the pitfall with this is like, like I'm looking at this and seeing it says position absolute width 331 explicit widths. We, we wouldn't we wouldn't use that code in production because everything we do is based off a of flex grid which resizes based on the size of the viewport mm -hmm. um so the the css that it generates is not always going to be one-to-one -one that matches the tech stack of whatever you're working on with your developers but it's a good starting point for them and frankly I, i'm gonna i'm gonna pump up my my guys um, our devs are so stinking talented at Lonely Planet. I just send them the Figma prototype and they just build the thing out and it looks pixel perfect on every time. Like I don't ever have to mess with this. But if, if I am handing off a project to them, I will add them to the project in Figma so that if they want to get in and start clicking around and get values or you know hex colors or whatever, they can absolutely do that. But our design system is, is robust enough at this point um, to where you know, pretty much everything I design is based off of little tiny components of our design system. So really um, a lot of what they're doing is just stitching together what we call atoms, uh, A-T-O-M-S. So they'll, they'll take, you know, the, the button and the card shape and they'll they'll shove that together and that all the, the code for those elements already exists. They're just kind of arranging it together in a new component. Um, there are outliers, of course, but um, it's it's good. So I guess to answer the question, Figma is good for handing off to developers, um, but there are some things that that you know the developer would need to be wary of, such as you know absolute positioning as opposed to flexbox or you know CSS grid or whatever tech convention your dev team happens to be using. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well, this was really cool. There's so much stuff in Figma. Like like I said, I I've kind of just stuck my toe in the water and kind of messed around with it a little bit, but I know that I've like just not even scratched the surface of anything <laughs> in there. So I, I'm, um, you know, I do more back end development than anything else. I have very little experience with front end development. So that kind of thing has always been really intimidating to me. Um, and so I've kind of been looking for like a good place to start just to, you know, um, <laughs> so that my app isn't just all green buttons. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> it's like, you know, in CSS that <clears throat> you can write important after uh, a class to make sure that it overrides any, anything else, um, which you should never do. <clears throat> but why not? I just think it's it's bad. Oh. <laughs> just to write everything that's important. <laughs> but my, my point being is that we had that we always had this joke where we would sometimes when I work in an agency we would get spaghetti spaghetti code back from some other company and you know the, the client is throwing their hands up and they're like I can't work with this these guys anymore here fix this for me and you know we open it up and like almost every style declaration in the CSS has important after it. And my buddy, Robbie, that I used to work with, would always say, if everything's important, nothing's important. <laughs> so I would say that with the green buttons, you know, if everything's green, like, you're not going to click anything. So. 
<laughs> you guys are going to see my first app on the app store soon. And it's just going to be just the nothing green. but green buttons. You won't know what any of them does. It'll be a surprise. <laughs> um, cool. So do we have, I guess um, we have, <coughs> I think one more question, but if there are any other questions from anyone who's here hanging out with us, um, go ahead and post them. Um, otherwise, we typically like to end um, uh, the talks by asking our guests to if for for three recommendations, and this could be anything. It could be related to your topic. It could be just a book you read recently that you liked, a movie, or um, you know, a podcast, Something on an Netflix album. That you really like. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So um, I know we're kind of putting you on the spot it's usually just kind of an off the cuff just three things that that come into your head that you would want to recommend yeah um so i'm gonna i'm grabbing a url really quick yeah yeah i'm gonna put this in the chat um oh antonio brown says what are some good tips for figma um okay. antonio my first tip for you for figma would be to join the friends of figma slack group because within there, you will have more information than you could possibly be able to consume. Um, and there will be tutorials linked there and um, beginner's guides to Figma. And if you get stumped on anything, there are channels where you can ask other users, how do I do it? X, Y, and Z in Figma? And um, you know, if you ask nicely, I'm sure someone will, will answer you. So can I, how do I add to the, to the chat here? I'm trying to figure out this fancy software you guys have. <laughs> uh, you can basically just type it as a comment. If you see the comment yeah. section, you can type it as a comment and we, we can show it. I'll tell you what, I will, Katie, I will send this to you on Slack. Yeah, perfect. And then you can relay it for me. So um, for Antonio, I'm linking the Friends of Figma um, URL. And then for, so I guess that's one of my things. Hey, that was easy. <laughs> one of my things would be guys, check out Friends of Figma. Um, and then um, as far as a podcast, there is a guy that um, does a podcast. His name is Tanner Christensen. Uh, I'm not sure where this guy works now, but he used to work at Facebook and I think he worked at Uber. He's a, he's a product designer and he's super talented. And he's got a podcast he does with another lady, um, and it's called New Layer, and it's all about product design and sometimes just design in general. So they get into talks about, um, you know, designers' career trajectories. Should you become a manager or should you become a high-level individual individual contributor? What are the benefits and pitfalls to each? Um, you know, there's there's an interesting talk which is near and dear to my heart is are how do designers stay relevant as they get older? Because I'm an old man. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of good, a lot of good content on on the new layer podcast. Um, and then lastly, um, gosh, I don't know. Like I don't know about you guys, but I tend to like to have music when I work. Um, so there are some really good like chill work playlists on um, on Spotify. But lately, I've been listening to this guy. He's like an instrumental hip hop artist, and he goes by the name Karma Win. And his stuff is the best work work to music ever. And I'm gonna link Katie to his profile on Spotify. So there you go, Friends of Figma, New Layer Podcast, and Karma Win Chill Instrumental Hip Hop Beats. So. I'm gonna post this in the comments. I'm always looking for good music to work to. Yeah, it's really good stuff. I just put Spotify here. I would send you guys like a really ripping like spring '77 dead show, but you know it's like it's an acquired taste. So um, we have <laughs> Trey says I code to Norwegian black metal exclusively. <laughs> And I and I believe him because <laughs> Trey was in my cohort and he listened to awesome music, so I, I completely yeah. believe him. <laughs> I'll have theme days too, where I'm like today, like the other day, I was as all Iron Maiden all day. <clears throat> the next day it'll be all you know whatever. 
but uh, yeah, there's there's so much good music out there, and it really helps me stay focused in between you know the meetings and everything. It's kind of like I get off a Zoom meeting, and I'm like, okay, I got to get back into design mode. The easiest way for me to do it is just put on some beats or some jams and just like close the door and like just go for it. And then you know I'll get an hour and a half of good work time in before the next freaking Zoom meeting comes up. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where somebody posted in our work Slack the other day that um, there's a website that's like, I think it, it's called something like your favorite bar or something like that. And it's just yeah. like ambient bar sounds that you can listen to. I know there have been similar things popping up since since everybody's been quarantined um, of like, you know, office sounds or coffee shop sounds. Which, mm -hmm. um, and also on the Art and Tech Slack channel, we mm -hmm. also have a lot of play, play playlist recommendations. Yeah, yeah. Um, so actually, I'm going to go ahead and up um, our website here. So we do, um, like I mentioned, we do have a new Slack channel. Um, and we're sharing, yeah, music tips and um, information about upcoming events. We would love um, everybody to join. Um, and you can find a link to that on our LinkedIn page. And we have a link, we have a link to that um, on our website that's here at the bottom as well. And also on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. we are back today. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, that is brings us almost right up until time. Um, Zach, is there any other anything else you want to share? Any last words of, of wisdom or um, anything we didn't get to that you're just like dying to talk about? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it's okay if there's not. <laughs> I, I guess I guess what I'll say is like if if anyone's interested in changing sort of their medium. And, and doing something different. Don't be scared to do it, just do it. Find the time. Obviously don't necessarily quit your job and throw a caution to the wind unless you can afford to do that. Um, at the time, we I didn't have any kids, so I could, but um, it was scary when I quit my job and I started learning a new discipline, but it was worth it. So invest in yourself and, 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 you know, learn new things. I think life is all about <clears throat> gaining new knowledge and then acting on that new knowledge. So don't be scared to make a change and learn a new, a new medium or a new art form if you want to do it. Absolutely. I second all of that. Um, Zach, I think we've talked before, like this was, you know, um, software is the second career for me as well. Um, and it was one of the scariest things, <laughs> one of the scariest transitions I ever made. Um, but, yeah, again, have, haven't looked back. Um, so grateful to be kind of in this space because there's just so much you can you can do. There's always something to kind of keep you interested and keep you engaged and yep. um, keep moving forward for sure. For sure. Yep. Thanks for having me, guys. This is awesome. Yes, thank you so much so for much joining fun, us this thank month. Thank you so yeah, much for doing that. So, so great. Um, for everyone who's still here, thank you for um, for attending this month. We hope to see you on our LinkedIn page, Facebook, um, our Slack channel. We would love for everybody to join our Slack channel. Um, and one other thing, if you haven't already, we have free stickers you can sign up for and we will mail them to you in a lovely um, black envelope with silver writing. It's just beautiful. Um, handwritten. <laughs> handwritten, that's right. Um, if you would like to sign up for our mailing list and get a free sticker, just jump over to our website. There's um, a sign up form for that. We're mailing out the next batch this week. So um, we would love to send you some some freebies if you're interested. Yeah. And we're also looking for volunteers. So if you want to help us to build the art and tech community in Nashville and you have like one hour a month, that's also great. We need people to help us. We maintaining our website to help us with social media with various stuff that doesn't take a lot of, that they don't take a lot of time but we always need people to help to help us with the small stuff Absolutely. so if you have even one hour a month just reach out to us and we can really we can really use your assistance definitely and um very soon we're hoping to be able to transition back to um or transition to in-person uh, meetings and workshops and we envision these being combination of, of these kinds of like conversational talks about what people, you know, who, who kind of um, work in this intersection of art and technology, um, 
you know, what, what they're doing, but also, you know, hands on workshops, actually making things, building things and, and collaborating with people that you might not normally get to see or work with. Um, and so we want to, you know, start getting ideas for projects and, and putting things together. So um, definitely you know, sign up for our mailing list, follow us on um, the socials, and hopefully we'll be able to see everybody in person in the coming months. Um, Thanks, Blade, guys. <laughs> yeah. Zach, thanks again so much. This is really, really great. Thank you, Zach. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> Appreciate it. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye.